Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases and today we are discussing another solved case. I only quite recently heard about this case and felt compelled to discuss it because of the victim, Morgan Huxley. Morgan comes across to me as your very typical Aussie guy. Happy, friendly, sociable, laid back, always up for a good time. The kind of guy that you just want to be around and be friends with. Unfortunately, after his passing, he got pretty screwed over by the media, who victim blamed him as they very unfairly dissected and discussed every aspect of his private life. But we will get into that later. As always, my sources are linked down below. And a friendly reminder, I discuss cases on this channel based on available news coverage, books, documentaries, etc. I am not a journalist, just somebody with an interest in researching and reading up on local cases. And I attempt to cover each case on this channel with as much respect for the victim or victims as possible and with as little bias as possible. My videos are not opinion pieces, nor are they presenting new information in any of the cases discussed unless stated. Having said that, let's get into it. So today we're heading back to the year of 2013 to the suburb of Neutral Bay in Sydney. There lived 31 year old businessman Morgan Huxley. Morgan lived in a two story apartment on Watson Street with his housemate, 24 year old Jean Redmond. Neutral Bay, by the way, is a fairly affluent suburb of Sydney. It's visually appealing, family friendly, minutes from Sydney's CBD, and an overall safe place to live. As I said, Morgan was a business owner. He started his business, Huxley Marine, in 2009, which specialised in seawall and jetty construction. So you may assume from this business venture that Morgan liked the ocean. And you would be correct in this assumption. <laughs> he studied ocean engineering at TAFE. TAFE being kind of similar to community college over in the States, I believe. He also enjoyed going out on his boat and when on land, Morgan loved a good game of soccer, working on his car and hanging out with his close circle of friends. From what I could gather from my research, Morgan did have quite a few friends, many of whom he'd known since his primary school days, which I, I think speaks volumes to his character. I'm always super impressed when I meet somebody past their latish 20s that has kept multiple childhood friends friends. Keeping friends at any stage of life is no easy feat. I personally don't even have any friends from university, let alone childhood. And in fact, Morgan's best mate, Chris Moroni, was one of those friends that he had known since his primary school days, and someone who will come up in this video again in just one moment. It also sounds like, from what I read, that he was very close with his family. His parents were Dee and Alan, and he had two siblings, a sister, Tiffany, and a brother, Oliver. So now we're going to discuss the events of Saturday, September 7, and Sunday, September 8. That Saturday evening, Morgan was heading out to an engagement party for his best mate, Chris Marini, and his fiance, Philippa Brophy or Brophy, I'm not too sure how to pronounce her last name. Dressed in a blue shirt, cargo shorts and thongs or flip-flops for my non-Aussie viewers, Morgan headed out to the suburb of Lane Cove to get the celebration started. The engagement party itself was a pretty laid-back affair and by all accounts, Morgan and all the other attendees were in good spirits and had an overall great evening. At the end of the night, Morgan shared a taxi with Chris and Philippa as they all lived in Neutral Bay. And on the way home, Morgan asked his friends if they would be keen for one last drink just to wrap up the celebrations. But the couple decided it was time to call it a night and they headed home. As Morgan parted way with his friends, he decided 
he was just going to go for one last drink by himself, just at his local bar at the Oaks Hotel, which was like literally a few minutes walk from his Watson Street apartment. Before heading to the bar, Morgan, who was barefoot by this point, having left his thongs flip-flops at the engagement party, quickly popped into a nearby Easy Mart to get some cash out from the ATM. After this, he headed to the Oaks Hotel, ordered a schooner, which is a glass of beer, and sat by himself on his phone, texting a couple of friends. At this point, it was around 1am. About half an hour later, he was informed that the bar was closing up for the night, so he finished his beer and went on his merry way. At around 1.30am, Morgan can be seen on CCTV footage, stepping onto Ben Boyd Road and heading towards his apartment. As I said, he lived incredibly close to the bar. I'll have a map up on the screen, but basically from Ben Boyd Road, he went down Military Road and then onto Watson Street where he lived. Back at his apartment, his housemate Jane was actually home and asleep, or at least trying to sleep in her bedroom. When she heard Morgan arrive home, she got up, shut her bedroom door before crawling back into bed, popping in a pair of headphones and drifting back off to sleep. Meanwhile, Morgan headed up to his own bedroom, opened up his window and passed out on the bed dressed in the clothes that he had been out in. Although for some reason, when he got home, he put on his white running shoes. Whether he was planning to head out again or was just a little bit tired and confused, we, we will never know. 15 minutes later, Jean heard a knock on the front door. She was actually expecting her boyfriend, Erton Yukar, who worked late nights at a kebab shop, hence the late visit, but he had his own key to the apartment, plus he wasn't due over for about another hour hour. So Jean just ignored the knock and went back to sleep. She assumed it was just a visitor for Morgan. A few minutes later, Jean heard some noise and commotion outside of her bedroom and unable to ignore it this time, she got up to see what was going on. As she opened her bedroom door, she was met with a truly horrifying scene. Her housemate, Morgan, was lying on the floor, unconscious and soaked in blood. Jean began shouting Morgan's name and shaking him to try and wake him up before running to grab her phone and call the emergency services. Unfortunately, in her panic, Jean, who was Irish, phoned the UK emergency line 999. When this didn't work, she phoned her boyfriend, who by this point had finished work and was waiting for his bus. She frantically began explaining the situation, and I'm going to assume at some point Erton told her to phone triple zero, the Australian emergency line, which she does. When Erton arrived at the apartment, he found Jean on the phone to emergency services, who were instructing her on how to give CPR to Morgan. At 3.05am, an ambulance arrived and paramedics immediately check on Morgan. He is alive, but barely clinging on to life. As Morgan was rushed off to hospital, police arrived and cordoned off the crime scene. Jean, who was still dressed in her pyjamas, and I imagine by this stage was a physical and emotional wreck, was taken down to the police station to make a statement. And I didn't really see any articles mention this, but what Jean did was truly phenomenal. For all she knew, someone dangerous was still in her apartment, but she didn't run away or leave Morgan. She stayed, called emergency services, and attempted CPR, which CPR on its own is a physically exhausting task. But to do it on a person that you know that is blood-soaked, that is just terrifying and traumatic. So well done, Jane. 
At 3.30am, Morgan Huxley was pronounced dead. He died from a total of 28 stab wounds. The murder of Morgan Huxley soon hit the headlines. It was horrific and confusing for many reasons. The location being Neutral Bay, generally a very safe area. The victim, an established businessman, and of course the brutality of the crime. As I mentioned at the beginning, Morgan's character was dragged through the dirt by the media, as they unfairly speculated that a scorned ex-lover was responsible for his murder. But we'll discuss the media's portrayal of this case in just a little bit. Meanwhile, an investigative team was formed and got to work in solving Morgan's case. At this stage, Morgan's phone and the murder weapon, a knife, were both missing and to this day actually, neither items have been located. Considering the brutality and violence of this attack, investigators initially suspected that the killer was someone that Morgan knew. In the early stages, they had two persons of interest, an ex-girlfriend that had recently shown up at Morgan's apartment unannounced while he was out, and the landlord of Morgan's business premise, whom he'd apparently had some sort of run-in with. Investigators, of course, also retraced the final night of Morgan's life, from the engagement party to his final stop at the bar and his short walk home. There didn't seem to be anything suspicious in regards to the engagement party. As I mentioned earlier, everyone, including Morgan, had been in good spirits that night. At the Oaks Hotel Bar, CCTV showed that Morgan had been there by himself. He was there for about half an hour. He came in alone and he left alone. CCTV also managed to capture the first portion of his walk home as he stepped onto Ben Boyd Road towards Military Road. Again, he was walking home alone in the direction of his apartment. However, CCTV also captured something else incredibly interesting, or someone else, I should say. It appeared, unbeknownst to Morgan, that he was possibly being followed home. A young boy, appearing to be in his late teens or early 20s, was not just walking behind Morgan, he was pretty much jogging in order to keep up with him. This boy was dressed in a black long-sleeved shirt, black shoes, had a blue backpack swung over one shoulder and across his chest, and was wearing checkered chef's pants, helping narrow down the search for this mystery boy. The CCTV footage didn't follow Morgan's entire journey home, Therefore, it was certainly a possibility that the young boy had not been following Morgan and his walk slash jogging behind him was a coincidence. But regardless, investigators still did want to speak to the boy to at least rule him out. Police began inquiring at local cafes, restaurants, and hotels to see if anyone recognized the boy. As I said, he was dressed in chef's pants, so they figured it was likely that he worked at some sort of hospitality venue in the local area. The boy was soon identified by a local cafe employee. This cafe was located in front of the Sydney Cooking School, and it turned out the boy worked there as a kitchen hand. The manager of the Sydney Cooking School was contacted and confirmed the identity of the mystery boy as 20-year-old Daniel Jack Kelsall. On the afternoon of September 24, just over two weeks since Morgan's murder, investigators paid Daniel Jack Kelsall, who went by his middle name Jack, a visit. Their first impression of Jack Kelsall was that he was a friendly and helpful kid, although a little bit of an oddball. Kelsall was soon taken in for a formal interview, which can be found here on YouTube on an episode of Crimes That Shook Australia, which I'll link down below. 
I may add portions of the interview into this video. I guess that'll be up to editing me. But for the sake of time and probably for copyright purposes, it's probably going to be very small portions. So it's definitely worth checking out the episode to get a full sense of Kelsall's character through this interview. My personal description of him during the interview would be that he was softly spoken, definitely a little bit awkward, even a little bit childish, although he was only 20. He did speak with some level of intelligence, although I don't really think he took the police interview very seriously, even giggling in parts of it. So just to fill in some of the blanks, Jack Kelsall had been working a shift at the Sydney Cooking School on the evening of Morgan's murder, and he finished up his shift just before midnight. Kelsall said he didn't feel like going straight home, so he popped into the nearby Easy Mart where he grabbed a drink and some licorice for his mother. Then he stood outside an Indian restaurant called the Curry Palace and briefly made small talk with the security guard before jogging away. During this chat with the security guard, Kelsall had actually pointed out the barefooted Morgan giving him the nickname No Shoes. Of course, investigators asked him why he was jogging behind Morgan Huxley on the night of his murder, to which Kelsall replied, Why'd why, why you jog? It's cold. My mum tells me if you're cold, go for a job. How far did you jog for? Not very far. How far is not very far? Oh. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, from, from the lights, from a little bit after the lights to a little bit before the opening to the restaurant, the, 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 the um, folks restaurant. Uh, okay, sure. But that doesn't explain why he wasn't jogging in the direction of his own house, but rather in the direction of Morgan's. Kelsall lived on Spruzen Street with his parents, which is about a 15 minute walk from the Oaks Hotel. So, and I'll have a map on the screen to demonstrate this. His fastest route would have been to cross Military Road and continue down at Ben Boyd Road. Instead, he turned right at Military Road following Morgan. When investigators asked him to explain why he chose this route, he seemed to struggle to remember at first, but then he told them that he was going back to the Sydney cooking school to make sure that he had turned out all the lights. To get back to the cooking school, he did need to turn right onto Military Road, so this explanation does technically check out. Investigators also asked Kelsall if he knew Morgan or had had any interactions with him that night or ever. To which Kelsall said that he did not know him, but he had seen him around that evening. Once at the Easy Mart where Morgan was getting cash out, Morgan had asked Kelsall if he wanted to use the ATM, to which Kelsall said he didn't. Then again, on the median strip of Military Road, Kelsall says that the pair smiled at each other but never spoke. Jack Kelsall, although a little strange, at this point seemed like an unlikely suspect. He was awkward, gangly, barely out of his teens, and didn't know Morgan from a bar of soap. As the interview wrapped up, as is pretty standard protocol, investigators asked him if he would submit a DNA sample. Kelsall said he didn't feel comfortable to do so, and as he was under no obligation to, investigators had to let him go. After his police interview, Jack Kelsall actually had a shift at the Sydney Cooking School, and his boss, who knew that police were looking into him as a potential suspect in the Morgan Huxley murder, directly asked him, did you do it? To which Kelso replied that he didn't and that him walking behind or jogging behind Morgan that evening was just one big coincidence. 
His boss accepted this explanation until Kelsall added, but if I did do it, there's no way they would catch me. Two days after Jack Kelsall's police interview on September 26, Kelsall actually contacted the investigative team and told them that he had not been completely honest in his initial interview. The investigator speaking with him on the phone, Detective Senior Sergeant Mark Jukes, asked Kelsall if he would be willing to meet up with him that day and discuss things further. Kelsall agreed, telling the detective that he was currently in Neutral Bay in a Woolworths car park. Detective Mark Jukes, along with another officer, met up with Kelsall in the parking lot and spoke to him in what would be an informal and unrecorded interview. Jack Kelsall admitted that he had indeed spoke to Morgan Huxley on the night of his murder, but he hesitated to tell police as he didn't want to become a suspect. Kelsall's new version of events claimed that Himself and Morgan had began chatting on the median strip of Military Road. He said Morgan appeared upset, so he asked him if he could cheer him up. He then alleged that the pair went back to Morgan's apartment where they had consensual sex. It should be noted that there was absolutely zero proof found following this claim to suggest that Morgan was interested in men. His friends and family said he was only interested in women and no secret dating profiles, conversations, etc. were ever uncovered to suggest otherwise. Anyway, Kelsall said that when he was leaving Morgan's apartment, a blonde woman walked in. Kelsall theorized that the blonde woman went into some sort of jealous rage after seeing him leave Morgan's apartment and killed Morgan. However, Detective Senior Sergeant Mark Jukes did not buy a word of this new version of events. He believed that Kelsall invented this new story because he knew that his DNA would soon be found in Morgan's apartment and he needed an explanation as to why. Kelsall was arrested following this informal interview during which time his backpack was seized and investigators obtained a search warrant for his, well, his parents' home as well as a search warrant for the Sydney Cooking School. And nothing much was found in his house, but one knife was found to be missing from the cooking school. After the arrest, Kelsall refused to talk without a lawyer and he also refused to acknowledge the conversation he had had with the two detectives in the Woolworths car park. And unfortunately, because this interview had not been recorded, it would not stand up in a court of law. Although they had to let Jack Kelsall go after his arrest due to lack of evidence, he was now their prime suspect. The investigation, of course, continued to gather evidence over the next several weeks until finally on March 8, they had enough evidence to re-arrest Jack Kelsall and charge him with the murder of Morgan Huxley. So before telling you what evidence the investigation uncovered, I want to discuss the way in which Morgan's murder was reported in the media. Several publications gave Morgan labels such as ladies man, Casanova and Playboy, among others. They suggested that Morgan's murder had been a Booty call gone wrong. Booty call is their wording, by the way, not mine. His personal life, particularly his romantic life, was publicly dissected and discussed. A speculation that a scorned ex-lover was his killer ran rife. There was literally an article with the headline, North Shore Casanova. And within this article, it named his ex-girlfriends and his supposed current one, their full names, with little blurbs about them. One blurb even stated, she thinks a woman killed him. I'll have this up on the screen, by the way. I mean, this whole thing was so incredibly bizarre and disrespectful. 
Victim blaming at its finest, implying that Morgan's own actions are what got him killed. The media basically wrote their own narrative about the murder, inventing what they believed was going to be the most interesting story, what would get the most clicks, sell the most newspapers, etc, etc. And of course, unsurprisingly, in the end, the media were completely wrong. As Australia would soon learn, it was not some bitter ex-lover that killed Morgan, but a total stranger. A little boy, or as the media dubbed him, the baby-faced killer. So back to the evidence. On Morgan's bedroom door, they found a fingerprint belonging to Jack Kelsall. They also found his DNA on Morgan's genitals. And Morgan's blood was found on Kelsall's blue backpack that he had with him on the night of the murder. Kelsall had actually made a amateurish attempt to clean the blood off his bag, but they were still able to extract enough evidence to prove that it was Morgan's blood. Kelsall even had the gall and the audacity to wear that same blue bag during his initial police interview. I think that really just goes to show that he really thought he was going to get away with it. He was smug and confident about it, which is disgusting. The final piece of the puzzle came from Kelsall's GP, Dr. Susan Pullman, and Kelsall's psychiatrist, Dr. Matthew Bolton. Kelsall had admitted to both of them that he had, in his words, intrusive thoughts about stabbing a random for the thrill of it. And lastly, although this does not prove Kelsall's guilt of Morgan's murder, it just proves that he's a shit person. Child pornography was found on his laptop. So before continuing on, I am going to very briefly touch on who Jack Kelsall was. Kelsall was born in Wellington, New Zealand, where he was adopted by his parents, Mark and Lynn Kelsall. He had two siblings, a sister and a brother, and by all accounts, he had a happy and privileged childhood. After high school, he studied hospitality and dreamed of becoming a chef. He moved to Sydney two years before the murder because his parents had moved there and he missed them. His parents described Kelsall as respectful, loving, caring, non-judgmental, hardworking, considerate, generous. Of course, they are just a little bias. And that is more than enough information about Jack Kelsall. He did also claim to have Asperger's and autism, although there seemed to be no medical proof behind his claims, and it was likely just his own self-diagnosis. Now that we know who killed Morgan Huxley, I want to go over a few other aspects from the night of the murder. As I mentioned, Jack Kelsall worked that night until around midnight. Afterwards, he popped into the nearby Easy Mart, where he first encountered Morgan. At 1am, as Morgan sat by himself at the bar, Kelsall stood outside the Indian restaurant and watched him from across the street. The missing knife from the Sydney cooking school is assumed to have been in Kelsall's bag by this point, which begs the question, did Kelsall plan this murder in advance? Furthermore, there are suggestions that Kelsall may have encountered Morgan in the past, they did live within a close proximity after all, and apparently frequented a few of the same takeaway places. So chances are they had at least passed each other somewhere along the way. However, six months previous to the murder, Morgan told his mate Chris about how a young, small guy had followed him home after a drink at the Oaks Hotel one night. He said the boy started chatting with him as he walked home, so Morgan assumed that the kid just lived somewhere on his street and didn't think too much about it. That was until the boy literally followed him up to his front door and followed him into his apartment, uninvited. Morgan pushed the boy out and although he found the whole situation a little strange, he never reported it to the police. If this was indeed Kelsall, it is possible 
that he spotted Morgan months previous, developed a crush on him, and potentially began stalking him. Or was Morgan just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Add to that, if it was a random attack, Morgan would have been an incredibly strange target for the scrawny Kelsall. Morgan was a pretty tall guy, standing at 183 centimetres, and he was pretty built as well, weighing about 90 kilos or 198 pounds. Under normal circumstances, Morgan would have crushed Kelsall like a bug. Unfortunately, after a night of drinking, his strength, reflexes and of course awareness were likely not at their peak. I also wonder if maybe Kelsall had tried to start up a conversation with Morgan as he walked home on the evening of the murder and maybe Morgan recognised him from their last encounter, if that was Kelsall, and the pair got into an altercation. I don't really like to speculate in cases, particularly when we will probably never know the truth because Jack Kelsall insists to this day that he is innocent. But it is frustrating that we are left with a lot of unanswered questions. But what we do know is that Kelsall followed Morgan home, knocked on his front door for some odd reason as heard by Jean, but then proceeded to enter the apartment after realizing the front door was unlocked. Kelsall then crept upstairs where he found two bedrooms adjacent from one another. Morgan's bedroom door was ajar and Jean's was closed. So Kelsall slowly pushed open the door that was ajar and this is where he found Morgan fast asleep on his bed. He proceeded to indecently assault Morgan, which likely woke Morgan up and then Kelsall proceeded to stab Morgan 28 times in what was a quick but incredibly violent attack. Morgan, who was probably so tired and he was in the dark and confused, would have had no time to react to this very quick attack on him. Before fleeing, Kelsall grabbed Morgan's mobile phone, perhaps, perhaps to prevent him from phoning the police, but he was likely unaware that another person was home and trying to sleep in the adjacent bedroom, Gina of course. Kelsall then walked home, disposing of the knife and the mobile phone at some point along the way or soon afterwards. At home, he placed the licorice he bought for his mother on the kitchen bench before getting into his pyjamas and playing on his PS Vita. And in the distance, sirens could be heard. From what I can tell, his bloody clothing was also never recovered. 18 months after Morgan Huxley's murder, in March of 2015, the trial began. It was a trial by jury and General Jack Kelsall pled not guilty to the murder of Morgan Huxley and not guilty to indecent assault. At the trial, Kelsall took the stand to speak on his own behalf where he told yet another version of events from the night in question. As I mentioned before, the informal interview in the Woolworths car park hadn't been recorded, therefore could not be used as evidence at the trial. And unfortunately, this also meant that the jury was not aware that Kelsall had told two different versions of his story prior to speaking in court. This third story he told was similar to the second version of events that he told detectives, except this time, during the alleged sexual encounter with Morgan, a mystery person entered Morgan's bedroom and hit Kelsall over the head. Of course, let's keep in mind that by this point, any head injuries would have healed up. So if this version of events had been true and if he had sustained any injuries, it would have actually been beneficial to tell investigators this version of events in the first place to 
I can never say this word, corroborate, corroborate ooh, his story. But anyway, Kelsall claimed Morgan had been fighting off this mystery person and it was at this point that he decided it was time to bail. He also told the court that he had not been honest with police during his initial interview for fear of becoming a suspect. Again, I do want to clarify that there is nothing to indicate that Morgan had ever been interested in men. The evidence I discussed earlier was also presented at the trial. The fingerprints, the DNA, the blood, Kelsall's admissions to his GP and psychiatrist of having intrusive thoughts about stabbing a random was almost excluded from the trial on the grounds of protective confidence, but ended up being allowed, thankfully. On March 18, after just over two hours of deliberation, Daniel Jack Kelsall was found guilty of murder and indecent assault and he was sentenced to a non-parole period of 30 years. After sentencing, New Zealand police actually began to take a closer look at Jack Kelsall and the possibility that he was a serial killer. That may potentially be responsible for several unsolved murders back in New Zealand where he was born. However, as of recording this video, no cases have ever been tied to Kelsall, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. So this leaves us with the frustrating question of why. Why did Jack Kelsall so brutally and callously murder Morgan Huxley? Was he a psychopath? Did he have a crush on Morgan? Was he jealous? Perhaps there was an altercation between the pair. Or did Kelsall really just have this twisted obsession with stabbing a random? Unfortunately, I fear we may never truly know the answer to these questions. And just to make it clear, Kelsall was assessed by both psychologists and psychiatrists and was not diagnosed with any mental health issues, nor was his mental health considered a significant enough factor at the trial to have any impact on his sentence. <sighs> anyway, this is one of those cases that really, really got to me. I mean, all cases that I research do affect me in one way or another. But like I said at the beginning, Morgan just comes across to me like... He was this really, really great guy. Happy, friendly, positive, funny. Of course, I don't know him from a bar of soap. This is just, I don't know. I feel like his photos, his, his, his pictures just radiate this really positive energy. But, I don't, yeah. It just devastates me to think that some little bastard bloody little shit snatched away this life that was so full of potential simply for the thrill of it. Anyway, I do want to thank you so much for being here and for listening to Morgan's story. And until next time, stay vigilant and stay safe.